Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You. Today I have an old friend, a former colleague, and someone who I hold in very, very high respect as a coach, Chand Das. Chand, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Ashutosh. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Chand is uh, from IIT Kanpur. He's from IIM Bangalore. He worked for ITC for 35 years. Uh, his last role in ITC was CEO of ITC Stationery Products. He's a certified coach and he's a startup mentor and angel investor. So Chan, talk to us a little bit about uh, your life with ITC, some key highlights. Well, it's been a long journey, but a thoroughly enjoyable one. And I guess uh, it's had its ups and downs. I must uh, point out that it gave me a great opportunity to build a knowledge of business and also start and shut down businesses. I probably am uh, notorious in the sense that I shut down at least two businesses and I started a third one which went on to become a great success and that's the one you briefly spoke about. It's the education and stationery products business. So we had a brand called Classmate, which we built from zero to over a thousand crores in about eight years. And uh, it continues to be India's largest and fastest growing student stationary brand. Uh, I'm quite proud of that achievement. Uh, Not so proud of the failures, but a lot of learnings from there as well. And what would some of these learnings be? So the learnings are that uh, I think it's important to look at, uh, you know, the market opportunities in terms of the size of the addressable market and uh, also whether you have the execution capability to be able to service that market. And I think there was one very interesting thing that uh, I learned was that if the business idea is handed down to you, versus your own business idea and the courage of conviction that comes from your own business idea, that seemed to uh, drive a lot more uh, success. Interesting. So, you know, taking you back a little bit, you know, the first Indian chairman of ITC, Mr. Ajit Haksar, and I had an opportunity to meet him also. He had uh, talked about a word called pronorial managers in ITC, which were professional entrepreneurs. Yes. What do you think that culture did in your life as you were building in all these businesses and in future life? I think it it really worked for me. I kind of experienced the entrepreneurial manager because uh, I was, I guess, lucky that I was given businesses to run. I was given an opportunity to start a new business from zero. And, uh, you know, whatever I learned and did in ITC is something that uh, has stood with me and it's kind of helping me now when I kind of reach out to entrepreneurs and help them build their businesses. So I completely agree with the pronorial uh, culture that was set in at ITC. And I think I'm uh, an example of that. Fantastic. Uh, You know, fantastic. I think that culture has benefited lot of people in the company who have moved it on. Has. It has. It has. I think you built businesses uh, I've also been after your, of that, yes. while at ITC and thereafter. Correct. Yes, yes Correct. absolutely. Correct. Absolutely. So you um, mentioned that, you know, you invest in startups. You're an angel investor. Yes. Um, what are some of the things you look for before you make an investment? So it's interesting. I mean, I was fascinated by angel investing and uh, I joined an angel network called the Kiritsu Forum. Mm -hmm. Kiritsu, incidentally, is one of the world's largest angel networks headquartered in the US in San Francisco, but operates about 55 chapters worldwide. Mm -hmm. The first India chapter opened in Chennai, Mm -hmm. where I happened to be posted as the CEO of ITC's education and stationary business. Mm -hmm. So I joined the Kiritsu Forum in Chennai as the first Indian member, Wow! right? And today, uh, when we look at uh, present day, there are over 200 members across four chapters. Now, what an angel network does is it uh, it brings you, uh, 
in touch with what is called screened startups, right? And uh, it also, uh, you are also part of a group of members who come from different fields. So there are lawyers, there are entrepreneurs, there are other professionals and so on. So the thing is, when you take investment decisions, it's a considered decision. It also leverages uh, the, the know-how of the membership at large. Mm -hmm. And there's a process of due diligence and so on. So I would say that if you're a member of an angel network versus an individual angel, uh, being a member of a network kind of reduces your risk somewhat. Okay. Although inherently an angel investing uh, is, is a risky business. Sure. And so people like me look at it as an asset class. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. High risk. Understood. Um, possibly high return. Absolutely. But you've got to figure out what uh, what portion of your uh, financial uh, corpus you're willing to play this game with. Correct. Very good. Okay. And when you look at, uh, you know, and interact with so many startups, what are some basic mistakes a lot of startup entrepreneurs make? Oh, there are many actually. So one is, uh, you know, uh, again, uh, I find that a lot of entrepreneurs are very consumed with their innovation or invention, but uh, don't necessarily look at, uh, you know, what problem they are solving, whether there are others who are providing solutions and how uh, the entrepreneur solution is better, superior or differentiated. Also, whether the market is large and, uh, you know, the addressable market is large enough and uh, you know finally uh, I think the effort of business development is grossly underestimated. Interesting. So there's a lot of debate we've had with so many people. Um, when you look at a startup entrepreneur, do you think uh, he or she should go solo or should they have a partner? The ideal uh, thing is to have a co-founder with complementary skills. So if the entrepreneur, for example, is a, is a techie, uh, the, the co-founder should uh, have some experience in maybe business development okay. and that combination really works well. If you have more than one co-founder uh, and sometimes I've known of startups who have three or four or five, there's a problem then of building consensus, building alignment, and that consumes a lot of organizational energy. So I would say ideally two co-founders. Uh, that's the best. And with complementary skills. With complementary skills. So, yeah. So, you know, you spend so much time with ITC. And um, I know how much ITC spends in terms of time on strategy. Yes. Um, one of the things that I find missing in a lot of startups is strategy. Correct. You know, someone gets a great idea, you yes. know, they start working yes. and then they, you know, raise money. Exactly. And then they start to figure out now what next. Exactly. What are your thoughts on a strong strategy? Yeah, yeah. So, so this is where people like you and I come in, you know. We, uh, so I, I uh, ask these questions, you know, what is your vision? What is your value proposition? Which is why I'm asking you. Yeah, question. how is it uh, superior and differentiated Correct. from existing solutions in the market? You know, and uh, so all of that. And then uh, what is your business strategy? Have you defined your customer target? Well, I find a lot of confusion even in customer definition. And I've known of a lot of startups who start with B2C and then move to B2B, for example because uh, they haven't thought it through well enough. So this is where uh, I think uh, people like us come in and we uh, help them uh, think through all these issues, mm -hmm. you know, it, it put, putting them on a firmer footing. Mm -hmm. True. I agree. Strategy is very, very critical. Yeah. So, you know, you said that you uh, look at angel investing as an asset class. Yes. And over the years, I'm sure you have seen in companies that you invested in yes. have raised more money. Yes. At what stage do you think a startup should start to raise money beyond angel? Uh, you know, I think that uh, they must prove that their product or service works. So there has to be market validation, albeit in a, in a limited geography. 
and the fundraising then comes in terms of uh, you know the scale up because scaling up requires building a larger team a larger infrastructure and so on and that is where they typically look to attract uh, the vcs uh, you know and the sweet spot let's say is uh, you know revenues of about uh, you know something like 50 lakhs a month okay in indian rupees uh, that's the point at which uh, vcs start getting interested yes so without taking names yeah would you have uh, uh, some examples of companies that raise money too early and did not make it yes and companies that uh, did not raise money and did not make it because oh, there are there are both a, yeah, because there are both examples no there are both examples so i my advice to startups is that try and bootstrap for as long as you can okay which mean do do friends and family and at least you know build your product or service prototype and do a validation of that product or service before actually even going out to raise angel funding correct and so the problem is that sometimes when you have too much money uh it's not well spent okay there's there's this abundance uh <laughs> feeling and uh, you know uh, it it gets wasted and too little money of course you run out of cash and uh, so it's a fine balance but it has to be measured and staged very well this is what i would say and one uh, challenge i have often seen with startups is that they tend to scale up too fast yes you know somehow or the other we have this big bug bear if i can use that term in our own country we must be pan indian yeah and yeah. i tell them i said even if you're sitting in the national capital region you've got 24 million people to address exactly what are your thoughts i completely agree with you in fact my advice to most startups is that start with a limited geography i call it an epicenter you know this is from the earthquake and seismology <laughs> paradigm yeah. that you consolidate your epicenter build a robust business yeah. around that and then start spreading out in concentric circles and uh, so so don't be in a hurry to go national i think uh, you know uh, there is an element of recklessness that comes in because again this is uh, based on a on a view that if i go national fast you know a vc will get interested and all of that but i think chasing money uh is 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 uh, is not a good thing mm-hmm. yeah i agree it's chasing a robust business model which which is uh, definitely a lot better and you know last question on startups you know come to your uh, passion for social entrepreneurship yes you are associated with bell grow Yes. Uh talk to us a little bit about the kind of work you are doing there. Yeah, so I really enjoy this piece uh, in fact the most because uh, you know a social entrepreneur is typically working in underserved markets at the bottom of the pyramid trying to solve chronic problems. So, you know, let's take say in the agri business the whole mandate is to try and improve farmer incomes and uh, in healthcare it's to improve uh, low cost healthcare delivery so through devices or through services in education it's to improve education outcomes in you know government schools and stuff like that so there are a large number of such entrepreneurs who are tackling these issues and uh, they also need inputs uh, from again people like us who can uh, so that they can build a sustainable position because these are for profit okay it's not they're not ngos mm-hmm. a social entrepreneur is for profit and yet delivering social impact mm-hmm. so it becomes harder to to, uh, to do both of these mm-hmm. but but uh, that's where we come in and we help them navigate this uh, terrain so will grow uh, the uh, you know the group that i am associated with is one of india's oldest and largest social enterprise incubators okay. so the role of an incubator is really of course to give some funding but also to give mentoring to put in processes both on technology and business mentoring that enable the the social entrepreneur to succeed in a in a incubation environment and then let the incubated uh, 
enterprise into the world correct uh, so that's you know incubation also comes from babies mm-hmm. who are premature babies Absolutely. put into incubators yeah Uh, they nurse to health and then let loose Absolutely. into the big bad world. Absolutely. So that's the that's what Will Grow does and right. has been doing for the last fifteen years. Uh, at the moment, there's a huge program that uh, is running in the eight low income states from Rajasthan to West Bengal. It's called the Invent Program, which is uh, supervised by Will Grow. And under Will Grow, there are four incubators. one of which is at iit kanpur okay. which is my alma mater yeah. and i am associated with the iit kanpur incubator where there are currently about 40 social enterprises uh going through the incubation process mm-hmm. and i am involved in mentoring all of them wow. so you know when you are looking at an investment in say um, a social enterprise organization and um a regular organization if i can use the word. right would you think of that investment differently yes uh it's interesting i uh, i try and support social enterprises and i have as a matter of fact invested in quite a few of them mm-hmm. because i feel that uh, at this stage in my life i would like to support enterprises that are for profit but yet are relevant and deliver social impact So to that extent as an investor I will tend to be a little more patient mm-hmm. with my investment and my expectation of returns Excellent. and this class of investors is actually called impact investors okay. yes who stay with the organization who stay with the organization and are there because of the impact so they are willing to wait longer for returns Very interesting yeah so after your uh, career with ITC you got yourself certified as a coach Yes, and uh, I know that you coach a lot of uh, people. Um, what is the difference between a mentor and a coach? Okay, so you know, as a mentor, uh, you actually share your experience with, uh, let's say, entrepreneurs or even with professionals. And mentoring tends to be more directive. All right, it's more uh, showing and telling. Right. whereas in coaching it's the other way typically coaching the kind of coaching we do is is for cxo level uh, you know leaders and the idea there is to get them to think for themselves so it's more asking than telling it's more facilitation and uh, it's helping them succeed by you know showing them how some behavioral modification can enhance their yeah. effectiveness interesting so you know from the perspective of an individual who is looking for a coach what should that individual look for in determining um which coach should he or she go to so the first thing is that when a leader is looking for a coach uh, i think Uh, the first thing is that the leader should be motivated to walk the coaching journey because the coaching journey is typically a nine-month kind of program, mm-hmm. and uh, so there has to be a hunger and a motivation. That's number one. Okay. The second thing is that uh, there should be a desire to improve uh, leadership effectiveness. Now you know coaching is used in a variety of ways. Uh, you know we sometimes consider that. if somebody is deficient he needs or he or she needs coaching but when it comes to leadership coaching funnily it's for already successful people it's adding that little bit extra to improve and enhance effectiveness and that's what it's all about so you know coaching is something which uh, chand has been in existence for a long time the western world has been using business coaches leadership yes. coaches life coaches for a long time yes in our country it's very recent because i think typically in the professional world it was someone senior who mentored you correct and in the family business it was an elder who mentored you yes what is changing now that there is a sudden surge for professional coaches so i think one is a lot of the multinationals that are coming in from the us for example are insisting on the leaders going through a coaching engagement before they transition to a cxo level job so that's been driving some of it 
and there are a lot of indian groups today uh, who have uh, let's say realized the kind of benefit that such a program helps in, in imparting their leaders mm. very interesting so now moving on chand uh, you know you and i are a similar age group so yes you know um, and given today's excellent health uh, facilities most of us will probably live till 85 90 maybe even longer yes which means that our so called retired life will be almost equal to our working life yes that's true and therefore it becomes very essential for uh, uh, people over 60 yeah. to be able to plan their second innings correct you have planned it very well uh, right yeah. um what are some of your uh, you know learnings and what kind of advice would you give to people who are reaching this age of superannuation right and uh, who haven't planned at all i think this is a very important point and uh, you know the planning actually begins 12 to 18 months ahead of your retirement date uh, so the retirement date is known right yeah <laughs> so it sometimes surprises me that people don't think about what they wish to do in their second innings the other important point is that uh, while you are at the level at which you are which is typically you know a cxo level manager or a business leader you know at that time when you try and build your networks or get into those uh, networks which you think will help you in your second innings the demand for you at that time is high because you're in harness right uh, so my learning is that uh, 12 to 18 months please think about what you'd like to do join the networks while you're in harness and uh, build your capability i mean i i did my certification in the last year of my service yeah. and i also joined a couple of these other networks that we've spoken about the angel network and also and so on so that's what i would say yeah. and i i think uh, people don't do this they start thinking about what to do after they retire and i think their value rapidly depreciates after that because i find uh, you know a lot of friends in, in the western world you know talk about retirement talk about what will they do later but in our country for some strange reason retirement is a bad word and every time you speak to people you say oh i'll tackle it when i get to it yeah i think that's too late too late is it yeah that's too late because uh, you know your networks uh, then to build those networks thereafter is harder uh, than while you are in service I mean, this is what i have experienced no, I'm, i'm completely in agreement yeah. with yeah. you so um, moving on uh, you know you've uh, led a hectic life um, you know um, and you're very very busy as a coach and you're you know you're with bill grow and you're investing how do you manage work life balance Oh it's great I mean I uh, uh, I'm enjoying a great work life balance now in fact uh, it's about 50 50 uh, so I consciously take time out to for example travel to read a lot more than I was reading while I was in service and what I enjoy the most is is giving back you know there's a theme that uh, runs through whatever i do which is really to help professionals and entrepreneurs succeed mm. that's what it is so whether it's coaching or mentoring or angel investing all of that is helping entrepreneurs and professionals to succeed there was this one question that i love to ask all my guests and that is that you know over the years we have had lots of failures um what are your biggest learnings from your biggest failures i think the most important thing is resilience uh, to be able to quickly get up pull yourself up and what actually wins the day is the courage of conviction in what you do so whether it's in you know running a new venture whether it's in uh, planning your second innings in in uh, you know driving uh, things that you do it's your courage of conviction mm. and it's the drive that you have which which actually takes you a very long way so that's something i believe uh, 
again we we should we should continue to sustain mm. fantastic my next question to you is uh, when was the last time you did something for the first time well a lot of what i'm doing now is for the first time i mean i i uh, and and uh, every new startup that i get engaged with every new coaching engagement is new and i really enjoy it i i think it 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 uh, it keeps the gray cells working and it's very satisfying you know and in most cases i would say that coaching mentoring is a private victory uh, and that's what i enjoy very much right yeah i know i mean you know you yes. were my guide when i was getting certified as a coach yeah. and you yeah. know these are things that you told me even then yes so chan my last question to you you know comes back to startups and your giving back what would your advice be to people who want to become entrepreneurs and you know these two buzzwords of uh, a unicorn and an indicorn seem to be have taken the entire nation uh, by storm I, i know what are your thoughts on uh, for startups should we be driven by valuation or by the business i am a little old fashioned in this respect okay. and i think uh, we should be driven by the business i am all for building a robust business model starting small and systematically growing it making sure that all the lead indicators are supportive of a sustainable business and i think you know investors valuation and others will come mm. and i feel that uh, there is too much distraction for the entrepreneur in chasing some of these things mm. so very often when i go and meet my investees or entrepreneurs and they start talking about fundraising i said look i'm not here to discuss fundraising i'm here to help you with your business model mm. you know what are your processes how many customers have you acquired what are your repeat uh, customers where is your customer satisfaction feedback you know uh, what are your internal processes so my focus is on helping them build a robust business and i think that goes a very very long way yes john thank you very much i think uh, you've been very straightforward and you've been very transparent and the thousands of people who listen to our podcasts will learn a lot from your words of wisdom Thank you again. Thank you Ashutosh. It's been a pleasure being here and thank you for having me thank on this so program. Much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Brand Called You podcast. Be sure to visit tbcy.in to join the conversation, access show notes and discover fantastic bonus content. You can follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Simply search for the Brand Called You. Thank you and see you next week.